Standing before an all-powerful God who created the universe, that you need to humble yourself to accept that free gift. You have to come to this point. It's called brokenness. Broken before God. Now the scripture says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Okay, it's going to happen. Now, the choice God is offering, He's seeking you, is to make that decision now in this world. We'll have eternal ramifications. Because you'll be reunited with Him for eternity. But if you deny that, reject that, one day when you get the opportunity to stand before God, you will bow down. You will acknowledge that. Except then it's going to be too late. I urge you, humble yourself before God. Over in Luke, that chapter we were in, if you read on there, it's another great story. The prodigal son. Remember that story, parable? Been taught in Sunday school for years. The son takes his inheritance, goes off, lives it, prodigal life, wasteful, spends it all, ends up destitute, slopping pigs for somebody, hoping to eat some of the leftover food that the pigs have to make it. He starts remembering, man, I had it so good. Back in my father's house. I wonder if I went back and totally humbled myself before my father. Maybe he would let me be a servant in his house. Because at least he fed his servants good. So he has, he wrestles with this idea. And eventually he goes back to his father. And his father sees him from far off. And he's like, oh, this kid. I can't wait. I told him. Now I'm going to give him what for. And maybe if he humbles himself enough, I'll bring him back slowly. No, he doesn't do that. He's like, oh, there he is. He's all excited. He goes out, bring a rope. Cover my son up. He's come back. Kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a feast. Brings him back into that relationship. But first, that prodigal son had to be broken. He had to admit his need. Same goes for you and I today. Back in chapter 9. Verse 9 through 12 now. And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master son, Jonathan. Get, check this out. Hey, Ziba, all that stuff that you've been looking over, all that stuff you've been taking care of, Saul's property, all his houses, all his servants and vineyards, I'm taking all that stuff and I'm giving it to the Fibbish. From now on, Ziba, you and all your sons and all the servants, what does he say? You, therefore, verse 10, your sons, your servants shall work the land for him. You shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded his servants, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants. Of Mephibosheth. Here's point seven. Grace, if you accept it, it's the most valuable gift you will ever receive. Bar none. Look at the picture here. David took Mephibosheth from low to bar, barren, empty, desolate, to a place of glory. He made him a member of his family. He rewarded him with property, servants, total restoration of his position, great wealth. Now hear me here now. We know that when we come to the Lord, God doesn't promise us escalades and big mansions here on the earth and worry-free lives and jobs that pay us more than we deserve. And That's not what He promises. But in the book of Ephesians again, He says, I've given you unsearchable riches. When you come into a right relationship with the Lord, it is unbelievable wealth, spiritual wealth that you have in Him. It's incredible. You hear about believers talking about life and life more abundantly. You ever look at other Christians and go, man, why are they? I mean, I'm, I, I put my trust in God, but I don't have that all that going on. You know, have you fully surrendered your life to Him? Have you really given it over to Him and living fully under His grace and receiving all He has for you? He has it available for you, for me. A valuable gift. In the book of Ephesians, there are five different specific verses that talk about the unsearchable riches that you have in Christ. Unsearchable. You can't measure them. So Mephibosheth now, he's got life more abundantly. Now that he's restored, he's received the grace. Finally, in verse 13. Two things here. 
one that's unspoken and one that's clear. Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem for he ate continually at the king's table and he was lame in both his feet. Now I want you to note one thing. Did David ever make mention one time of Mephibosheth's crippled condition? Did he ever note it? Everybody else in the story did. Oh, he's crippled. Crippled, crippled. Ziba said, oh, you mean there, there is one son, but he's crippled. David never mentions it. He looks at him and he says, hey, I'm going to restore you. And in this society, let me tell you something. If you're crippled physically, I need contempt. Okay? David never mentions that. Remember, he's a picture of God. Okay, when, you, when you're restored in a right relationship with God, your sins are forgiven. Psalm 103.12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far as He removed our sins from us. He forgives us of our sins. In this passage, David never mentions it. He welcomes him as a member of the family. So Mephibosheth, he's sitting at the king's table from now on. I mean, from the outhouse to the penthouse. Right? Talking about Beverly Hillbillies. Last important note here. Mephibosheth remains crippled. Okay? He didn't come into that relationship and all of a sudden, man, I'm all walking around. He remains crippled. This is important for you to know too. When you come into that relationship with the Lord, you, know, you are still...